Well, this is, in a way, a, a continuation of uh, the previous one, except that we now have the, the policymakers from the government, and we have a very distinguished panel. We have Mr. Ranjani Kumar Singh, the current Chief Secretary, we have Mr. Tripurari Sharan, we have Mr. Gulrez Hoda, and uh, also the lead academic for the India, uh, the IGC Bihar program, Ashok Kotwal. And chairing the session is a former Chief Secretary of Bihar, Mr. Anup Mukherjee. Anup, you have this. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, without further remarks, I'll start the session. Uh, just introduce the speakers. So on my extreme left is Mr. Gulriya Soda. He is a retired IS officer who's also served in the World Bank and the IFC, International Finance Corporation. Currently, he is advisor, sorry, he is a member in the State Planning, Bihar State Planning Board. On my left is Mr. Tripurari Sharan, Principal Secretary Industries. He has served in uh, several departments in the state government and also in the government of India. He is, he is a postgraduate in sociology. We do not have Mr. Chanchal Kumar because he was the principal secretary to chief minister. It would have been good to have him, but he's been called away for some urgent work. On my right is Mr. Anjani Kumar Singh. He's very well known to you, the chief secretary of Bihar. He has served long innings in education as the principal secretary. He has also been principal secretary to the chief minister. He oversaw the program about, one of the programs about which Bihar is being talked about, the cycle program, the flagship Mukhya Mantri Bicycle Yojana, first for the girls and then later on extended to the boys. And also the Mukhya Mantri Akshar Achal Yojana for literacy among the ladies. Earlier, he has also received the UNESCO Prize for Literacy. On the extreme right is Professor Shok Kotwal, the lead academic for IGC India Bihar program, a professor of economics at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. He's a development economist who's focused on poverty, labor, credit markets in developing countries, agriculture, the role of international trade and rural governance. He is also the chief editor of Ideas for India, which is on the website. I think he mentioned that yesterday. So we will start off with Tripurari. Uh, uh, I would request all each of the discuss uh, of each of the speakers to speak for not more than 10 minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, members of the panel and members of the distinguished audience, I firmly believe that <clears throat> sometimes, you know, fragments of anecdotes capture uh, vaster portions of reality than theoretical postulations, and therefore I'll start with a couple of them. You know, a few days back, <clears throat> we were discussing <clears throat> in the Empowered Committee meeting where plans are discussed, we were discussing <clears throat> the opening of a new engineering college. And uh, uh, the chair in the committee said, do we really need to open new engineering colleges now? Uh, well, the discussion went on for a while, but I 
also chipped in with this bit of information that uh, while we were trying to open new engineering colleges today, there was a time when we were also closing down actually existing engineering colleges. This was way back in the 1980s, in the mid-1980s, when <coughs> the government actually uh, took over private engineering colleges and there was no teaching in those colleges for almost close to 20 years. And that was the time when uh, the so-called engineering colleges in the south were sprouting like mushrooms. And today, uh, we, all, we all are aware of the phenomenon that uh, exists in Bihar. Every middle class family worth its salt sends its children to some engineering college down south, whether it's in Pune or in Bangalore or wherever. So the other, other thing that I wanted to say <coughs> was that, you know, <coughs> uh, we are witnessing, we have witnessed in Bihar a very strange paradox. You know, Bihar used to be, for a long time, it, it still continues to be, you know, la, la, many are districts of Bihar continue to be what we typically term a remittance economy. But <coughs> Bihar also, is the site of uh, a reverse remittance economy. Because having lived in the city of Pune, I'm aware of uh, how many thousands of children from Bihar study in that city alone. <coughs> we can forget about Bangalore and other, other areas like Manipal and so on and so forth. And therefore, <coughs> a few thousands of crores of rupees from Bihar go and get spent in so-called economies of the advanced state. The other paradox that <coughs> we often hear of and in the villages of Bihar is that <coughs> while Bihar has you know such a huge population of uh, agriculture labor, agricultural labor, you would not be want, I mean, you, you would not be <coughs> surprised, you should not be surprised if there are complaints of labor actually in, uh, in the rural areas of Bihar. Now what, what do all these things point to? First of all, let me say that <coughs> when we talk about this so-called labor shortage, paradoxical as it may sound, the fact is that it uh, relates to a very vital uh, element of our agricultural development and that is that the kind of you know we have all talked in very general terms about productivity of agriculture and so on and so forth I've had occasion to look at the agricultural uh, agriculture department head the department for a while so I am <clears throat> aware of the fact that farm mechanization the levels to which it should have reached by now in Bihar you know, it is not really reached. And because of this aberration, because of this aberration, we find this paradox of labor, so-called labor shortage and, you know, uh, excessive rural uh, agricultural population. Um, you know, <coughs> this is what, th this is something which leads me to uh, my other uh, postulation, and that is that, you know, <coughs> Conventional economic theory um, says that over a course of uh, time, you need to move your population in the villages to urban areas. The, the very dictates of economic development require that this population is moved to the urban areas. Now, my question is, is it possible? Is it really possible to do this in a state like Bihar where the proportions are so gigantic that <coughs> no government, however mighty it might be, uh, would be able to handle it. So then, this leads to another question. Where do we go from here? And what next for Bihar? Uh, let me first of all say, before saying anything very specifically, that you know whatever little one has learned, <coughs> in terms of uh, conventional economic theory and the role of state, I would like to state very emphatically that for many, many years to come, 
state will have to be the prime investor. It will have to be the prime investor in the development of the state in any of the sectors. And when I say state will have to be, the state will have to be the prime investor, then I obviously am pointing to something which has been much talked about because by itself, within the state, <coughs> there is not enough, there are not enough resources to be shored up to be able to meet this requirement. And therefore, we do need that external assistance. And I am not going to very specifically pinpoint what is that external assistance, because that would be walking a very thin line on a very sensitive issue. I don't want to point that out. But the fact is that we have already suffered a very big lag. Today, uh, our plan size in just over just a little less than 10 years, has um, galloped to um, <clears throat> almost uh, 25 times what it used to be 10 years back. But we need to even, uh, we need to give this space uh, <clears throat> to, to um, let this space go even further because, as I said, the kind of investment that is required will have to come from the state. Now, <clears throat> the second question is, when we are talking about the linkage between industry and agriculture, the, the, the question, the, the theoretical postulation that comes to my mind, which throws up a question is, you know, we have to really explore uh, and see what, what is the most optimal way to take. You know, um, people say there's no manufacturing possibility in Bihar. There are no big mines. Big manufacturing is not possible. But I like to ask one question. Where was on what was the growth, the initial spurt of growth of the so-called tiger economies postulated. We really have to look at that paradigm and see whether we can practice that in our state. <coughs> uh, uh, <coughs> well, uh, the industrial landscape in Bihar, as of now, does not give us enough reason to feel very um, um, very happy about, but the fact is that just in the last few years, it has taken off to a stage where we can really build on what is available in the state, you know, small value additions, small manufacturing, and village industries, and the second most important thing which provides the organic linkage between industry and agriculture is the non-farm sector. In the non-farm non sector, we'll have to find ways to explore greater possibility of employability and above all as i said right in the beginning <clears throat> by uh, quoting that example about our students our children moving away to different states we will have to really spruce up the quality of our institutions whether they are institutions in the business impa business of imparting basic education or they are institutions involved in the business of giving higher education because what of necessity we will really need to practice in the coming times is the politics of inclusiveness and the practice of excellence, especially excellence of our institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Tripurari. I would now request Sri Anjani Kumar Singh, Chief Secretary, to make his comments. Thank you, sir. Friends, when I come to such workshops and seminars, I find most of people, participants, are generally worried, especially in this type of growth conference. We assume that we'll get a prescription for development, and Bihar being the least, development, least developed state, lowest on the ladder, so there is a lot to worry, but I don't subscribe to this. We have developed a lot on most of the indicators. If you see any Bihari, if he sees 20 years ago, what was the situation in Bihar and what is the situation today, you'll find a great, great difference. But what happens when we see from a model point of view or from some international point of view, then we find a lot many things not happening. But I, I assume and my view is that all a state will have its own way of development 
they have to create their own path. The way they want to de develop, not some international agency want to decide whether we are developed or not developed. You take example of Bhutan. Bhutan is very developed. But if you see on all these indicators, they are not developed. What is the most comparative advantage that we have? That is youthful population. Nobody has. Today, it is Bihar and Eastern UP who are going to supply a skilled manpower to whole of the world, not to India, other parts of the world. But that is our strength, but only thing we have to skill them. So according to me, the highest priority is skilling the population. People will migrate. Whatever you do, people will migrate because you have very high density. Our bearing capacity cannot hold, uh, take so many people, so people will migrate. We want that they, uh, they will migrate, they should migrate. Only thing we want is they should go, go as a skilled labor in the market. If they are earning 500 rupees or 600 rupees in Delhi, they should earn 1,000 rupees a day. If we make that change, that will be a great change. Then uh, we started with Chandragupta Institute of Management. So when the good agencies, they came, came to recruit during their placement, they found that boys are brilliant. The boys and girls are very good. But when they were asked to talk on a, in a meeting or a seminar, they had a problem of a speaking English. They were brilliant. So they, when they were asked to write something, they wrote beautifully. But when they had to present in English, they were very, very bad. So what is the right thing is, you start a course of a speaking English, even in the management institutes, in our IITs. Our boys and girls are uh, very good in writing answers. But when they have to make a presentation, they fare very badly. So that is the area. Those are those things that we will have to do to, to, to skill our people who are migrating and going out for better jobs. Bihar has a chance to become an educational hub. Luckily, historically also, we had Nalanda University, Vikram Sila, Taksila, so many universities, international universities. During, during that time, and so many people came from all over the world. So why can't we become an educational hub? That is our huge strength. And if you go anywhere, whether it's Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, anywhere, who are the teachers? Most of them are from Bihar. So we have a tremendous possibility of becoming an educational hub. Another area is tourism. Bihar, after bifurcation and Jharkhand, creation of Jharkhand, we are left with what? We have a huge heritage which has not been exploited. Imagine a situation that if every Hindu comes to Gaya for Pindan, what will happen? Crores and crores of people, potential people, who can come as a tourist to Gaya for doing pindan for their ancestors. That's a huge potential. Though we have, now everybody is talking that we are getting more foreigners than Goa. But I'm not very happy because what is happening, some, some organization is arranging a trip from Kolkata or Varanasi or somewhere. They bring with, they come with packed food, the guide from Kolkata, even the vehicles come from Varanasi, what do they, they do? They use our infrastructure, they don't stay here. So we have to find a way, how can they be here for two, three days, two, three nights, they, then only they will spend money in Bihar. Otherwise everything is coming from outside. They are coming, of course, going to our Bodh Gaya temple, Mahabodhi temple, spending some time. Even food and water used to come earlier. Luckily now those things have improved. Now we have better infrastructure, we have some good hotels, so people are able to take good lunch. But we want them to hold. So for those things, we'll have to plan, plan. Buddhist circuit, Ramayan circuit, Sufi circuit, those type of circuits, Gandhi circuit. But, but uh, that is one huge area where we can, we should invest and we should get good results. Bihar is the only place if you travel from Gaya to Vaisali, you have everything. You have Hinduism, Buddhism, and Sikhism in just 150 kilometers. And, and the most important places, every Sikh has to come to, go to uh, Patna city. Every Hindu should go to Gaya. Every Buddhist should go to both Gaya. So we have all those places, and there's a huge potential. 
Tripuradi has already talked about agro-based industry. Though we are the largest producer of vegetables and fruits, one of the largest producer in India, but somehow because of, you know, we don't have the, those technologies to cold chain and those type of things and better marketing facility. Our farmers, farmers in Bihar can produce anything, any quantity, but when the question of marketing comes, then we badly fail. So these are the three, four areas, skilling of youthful population, becoming educational hub, developing tourism, and agro-based industries. I think if we work on these three, four things, Bihar will develop. Thank you. Thank you, Anjani. I would now request Mr. Gulrez Hoda to give us the benefit of his observations. We should also focus on inclusive, sustainable growth. So a few words on that, if possible. Thank you, uh, Anup. Uh, I'm Jenny Tripari, Professor Ashok Kotwal. You know, somehow got the feeling that the last session should have been the last end ending of this conference because the political executive should always have the last word. But you know, bureaucrats being bureaucrats, we had another session after the politicians had their say. So I hope the politicians amongst us will excuse us. Look, as all the speakers have said throughout the day, I think it has been a good ride for Bihar in the last 10 years, since 2005, definitely. The growth rate has been very good. Everything is looking up. So what do we say when what's next? I think somebody who's not been so closely associated with Bihar in the last 10 years, when I look at it, what strikes me is that whatever we have achieved, which is tremendous, is from a low base. So going forward, we have to lift ourselves to the next level of development. Do we need to do things differently? Maybe some areas we need to do differently. So what I would like to do is, I'd like to just touch on four themes which we can look at, rather than going individually into this sector or that sector. Because things like agribusiness, dairy, fishery, MSCB, education, I mean, these are all so obvious areas of priority. And the last uh, session had touched upon it, uh, that it doesn't bear any repetition. My framework of looking at how we lift Bihar to the next level of development is to see if we can focus on these four themes. The first theme I would like to call social environment. And by social environment, I'm including policing and land records as in one bucket. Even the initial growth rates which took place in Bihar Lot of that growth rate came through when peace came to society, once policing was strengthened. In fact, some of my friends who were associated with Bihar in 2006, 2007 would tell me that when a Daroga or a SHO of a Thana, instead of staying in a Thana for three months, he started staying for one year, the growth rate of Bihar went up by 2%. That is the impact of peace of society on growth. Why do I include land with it? Because I think land is very critical to social peace in rural Bihar, across Bihar. And the area under this theme I would really focus on is land record, getting into land reforms at all. That is another big area which we'll have to deal with. Who owns what land, how much land, is the record there? I think that is a critical area if Bihar is to reach its next level of development. Along with that on policing, uh, my learned colleagues will know a lot more about police reforms. Uh, I come to it from a different area. My approach is what is the police coverage for a state like Bihar? When I lo looked at the economic survey, the most re recent economic survey, I think there are about 850 or 900 police stations uh, in the state. If you look at some metric of what policing should cover in a state like Bihar, I would venture to say that even if you double the number of police stations in Bihar, you would be inadequately policing the state. 
Now, how do we double the number of police stations? Can we think out of the box? Do we have too many people? Is it very top heavy? How many sub-inspectors can you hire for every DIG or police? I'm just trying to throw these ideas out. Because if you have to go to the next level of development, you have to think outside the box and try to get more in terms of policing with the same budget which we have. Similarly, on the land records which I mentioned, I know the digitization process has been started. Uh, I can only argue for that to be put on a war footing so that we have digital land records for all the districts as soon as possible. This is also important for business. I mean, people keep telling you that we cannot set up business because there's no land. People, there is land, but people have no guarantee that the land they'll buy is the land will actually come into their position because there's dispute on the land. So that is my first theme which I would focus on. The second theme I would focus on is what I would call connectivity. Now, agriculture production is going up, agribusiness is going up. We have to find ways to link the agrarian market of Bihar to a much larger market, not only within India, but internationally. So within this theme of connectivity, you have to look at the rail networks, you have to look at the freight corridors, you have to look at internal container depots, you have to look at air transportation if you're talking about veg vegetables and agrarian produce and things like that. So the whole concept of connectivity, is Bihar connected to the rest of the world? I would like to find ways to define how we can make Bihar much more integrated. Maybe it sounds big, but I would venture to say with the global economy. Once I get that, our farmers will be starting to get the money uh, which, they, uh, which they should be getting. I mean, the example of maize is, is very valid. I mean, uh, people tell me in Purnia and Khagaria and eastern parts of Bihar, uh, the, the growth of the maize sector really took off when the exports to Southeast Asia started. And that's where you got the pricing boost for maize. So if we have the connections to the markets, to the international markets, uh, I think agricultural and the ben uh, prosperity of Bihar uh, uh, would be made much more simpler. The third area, we recognize that Bihar is a rural state, but I think we need to look at urbanization. Not only in terms of quality of life, but when you are talking about job creation, when you are talking about higher education, when you are talking about quality of health, these are things which are focused or centered in urban centers. So we have to look at at least four, five, seven cities which we can develop in Bihar, which will become uh, excellent cities, urban centers, which can attract the type of people whom you want for your knowledge economy, whom you want for your educational institutions, whom you want for your hospitals, where jobs will be created. Uh, I don't want to dwell too much on energy, a lot of, uh, uh, lot of speakers today talked about energy. Um, energy is absolutely essential if Bihar has to get to the next step. I know a lot of work has been done in the area of energy. My only out-of-the-box solution, or maybe uh, the way I may think differently about energy is that generation is an engineering problem, probably transmission is an engineering problem, distribution is not an engineering problem. Distribution is like selling glucose biscuits. Generation is like, distribution is like selling talk time. And we have the technology to use electricity distribution like any product in the market. We have to look beyond where we segregate our distribution from our generation and transmission. Chairman, last point, uh, because this is a panel mostly of bureaucrats, I think we look at the science of delivery of government programs. How can we make it more effective? You are the leaders, we are the leaders. Can we make each rupee which government of Bihar spends get value for itself? 
We are spending a lot on education. 20% of our budget is going for education. Are we getting returns? I think we need to talk a lot more about execution and about the science of delivery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gulriz. I would request Professor Ashok Kotwal to give us his views. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Anup. Um, I, I'm acutely aware that I'm the last speaker of the last session of the last day. And um, so I'll be short. One very rewarding thing about being associated with the IGC program is that uh, we academics and students of development get to interact with uh, seasoned bureaucrats like this panel. And I feel highly honored to be, with, uh, to be on the same panel as these people who have had to tackle these very difficult problems. I mean, as academics, we propose, but they dispose, and that's far more difficult. They have to uh, worry about the practical difficulties and um, the, 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 the political considerations, etc. But I'll just comment very briefly on what we just heard. Um, the first speaker, okay, so uh, Mr. Sharan talked about uh, the problem of the, the classical economic theory of development um, which stressed moving labor, like a structural transformation, moving labor out of agriculture into other jobs, industry and other jobs. And he also cautioned, like, you know, he says, well, um, theory is fine, but can we do this in a popular state like Bihar? Now, first, I, I think it's a very valid point that uh, many of the economic theories are really based on the historical experience of developed countries. But things change. Technology changes, uh, politics changes, and what was valid for one country in one context at one time may not necessarily be uh, quite effective for another country. And each place, even each state, has to uh, chart out its own course. Now, um, we heard over the last two, year, uh, the last two days uh, several talks which tangentially uh, touch this issue, right? Like we had this talk yesterday by Madhav Chavan, who talked about skilling of the uh, workforce and how difficult it was, right? And in fact, uh, what he seemed to be saying at that point was, um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not clear that the, this kind of intermediate skills uh, uh, which are imparted in uh, institutions like ITI and so on, are valued so much by uh, industry. That was his experience. Um, and in fact, the skilling experiments that Pratham is doing now uh, were much more, more oriented toward making this huge labor force in the informal sector uh, probably find self-employment, which was rewarding. So you're quite right that uh, uh, all this labor being absorbed by manufacturing may be a tall order, may be unrealistic. And we have to find other ways. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, manufacturing, which worked very well in the in East Asian context, um, um, may not be able to absorb this labor. A lot of our uh, labor may, in fact, end up in uh, service sectors like uh, health, education, and so on. Um, the the second thing, uh, the, the Mr. Anjani Kumar Singh. Um, mentioned one of the big assets of this popular state being the youthful population. A uh, lot of people have talked about this demographic dividend that, you know, we have uh, India as opposed to China or many developed countries have a very large part of the population in the productive uh, age group from 15 to 45, and that's a dividend. But it's only a dividend if these people have some human capital, right? They are, they are well educated, they are healthy, they can be productive. And um, so, so as a, uh, immediately what follows was 
uh, the point he made that uh, what we need is skilling, right? The, the skilling of this population and uh, uh, some of the things uh, uh, which are just simple skills like speaking in English, for example, um, was uh, one thing he mentioned. And indeed, to the extent that uh, many of these sectors, which won't be necessarily manufacturing, but uh, tourism and other service sectors, uh, a skill like speaking in English uh, would be very economically vital. Another thing he mentioned was Bihar could exploit its uh, rich heritage, the religious and historical heritage, as a tourist attraction. Right? It's a, it's, it would be a comparative advantage in this. And indeed, I mean, this uh, morning, uh, our friend Rukmini Banerjee took us around Patna because this was our first time here. And we stopped at the historical site where the old Patliputra uh, thing. I mean, it was, it's a very nice ground. We went in, there was this uh, old pillar, and there was absolutely no information for tourists. There was nothing mentioned, there was nobody there. We walked around and we went into a building and there were some pictures and then again um, uh, some um, old kind of remnants, probably uh, very old, but again there was no, no information at all to kind of uh, uh, take advantage of this, right? Which is very different from even uh, a country like China where uh, all these uh, uh, the old historical sites are uh, well documented. There, there is a, um, and, and uh, certainly uh, these things could be improved. Okay, the, the last speaker talked about the, these four different uh, uh, points. Again, I, uh, I, I thought it was, these are the very salient points. Um, first of all, uh, social environment, uh, the policing and uh, law and order. Uh, in fact, uh, we're looking at the, some of the uh, research proposals for uh, uh, IGC Bihar, and uh, w one very interesting proposal is very much about um, uh, how was it that the, uh, the present government, when he first came into power, managed to really change the law and order situation in Bihar uh, quite so swiftly? And the, the huge difference it made. Now, uh, you know, when we talk about, we talk glibly about kind of the um, promise of a, a flourishing market economy to deliver growth and so on. But markets, are very much based on certain, uh, certain foundations which we take for granted. Things like uh, well-entrenched property rights. Uh, uh, the, the, there is a rule of law, right? That contracts are observed and so on, right? And so when we are talking about opening up economy, uh, connectivity, markets, etc., cetera, the, the very first step has to be um, uh, well-entrenched property rights, which was the next thing you mentioned, land records, right? Um, the, the, the not having good land records can uh, give rise to uh, the disputes, the, uh, uh, the many, uh, many transactions, the whole land acquisition uh, act right now, um, is the, the problems are far more complicated because of the uh, confused nature of uh, actually who owns the land. So uh, again, a very valid point. Connectivity, if we link uh, the Bihar farmers to international markets, uh, it, uh, it would be very good. They could be exporting. Uh, this is a fruit producing uh, state and uh, of course it would play, uh, pay dividends. But we have, uh, all that would be conditional on the central government not uh, you know, not uh, putting export bans at random like uh, they have done on uh, onion exports in Maharashtra. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, for a long time now, the central governments uh, of uh, uh, different parties 
have uh, always pandered much more to the, uh, uh, you know, food prices or vegetable prices going up in the urban centers at the expense of farmers. A lot of this uh, kind of uh, uh, random bans on exports. And so, yes, you are right about the connectivity part, uh, as long as the central government uh, keeps this in mind. The last thing is, of course, uh, the uh, developing urban centers with the, where you have these uh, um, uh, services available, education, etc. And this is all again tied in with uh, the kind of sectors where the, uh, the, this vast uh, mass of uh, young people from Bihar are likely to find uh, employment, uh, health, education, etc. And last but not the least, the delivery of government services. And indeed, when you're talking about inclusive growth, uh, all these things matter, right? Health, education, uh, moving people to rewarding jobs, and so on. But for lots of people, even to get started, right? Uh, some of these things, like uh, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, the, the Food Security Act, and so on, uh, play a big role in basically enabling them to take advantage of some of these opportunities. And without that, inclusive growth will be just an illusory dream. That's about it. Thank you. Thank you. After what the speakers before me have said, I will not have very much to add, except that keeping in view Bihar's socio-economic background, the main challenge for us is human development, how to improve the capability, how to in fact give even basic capabilities to our people so as to ensure inclusive, sustainable growth. Education has been stressed. We need new models of learning. Health has also been stressed, but I would also like to add health as a part of lifestyle, which includes diet, it includes your surroundings, keeping the environment clean, and of course, proper sanitation. As regards <clears throat> different models of implementation, I think we are also all the time looking for solutions, what works. And in that context, the IGC has helped in bringing together both practitioners as well as researchers and policy makers. The role of government in a poor state like Bihar, of course, is paramount, but I think we need to make space for NGOs, for civil society to also contribute. Bangladesh has not had governance for decades, but its social indicators are better than India's in many sectors. Then, the, I think we also need, as uh, since we have here on the panel senior civil servants who will be policy advisors, I think we also need to go back to basics on how we design programs which can be implemented and which are goal-oriented, not inputs oriented. So far, most of our programs are input oriented and we measure our success in terms of expenditure and in terms of physical outputs, but not ultimately what the goal was. So in terms of program formulation, in terms of monitoring, in terms of MIS systems, mid-cost corrections, evaluation, 
I think these skills need to be strengthened in our systems. Many uh, experiments are being tried elsewhere in India and the world, and we need to learn from what succeeds and adapt it to conditions here. There is a regional dimension to development in Bihar, as in the previous section, previous session, one of the eminent speakers had pointed out that it is not enough to just concentrate on a few districts and say that uh, these are our growth, where growth is taking place. The rest of Bihar also, like we complain that uh, Bihar is being neglected in India, are places outside certain districts also are, uh, can complain in a similar way about what is happening in Bihar. Institutions had decayed for, for uh, fortunately over the last 10 years, institutional strengthening, institutional development has been taking place. We have proudly also spoken of the Bihar model of governance. There, I think we need to improve further the quality of governance which is sensitivity and attitude in a top down, right down to the cutting edge, learning to listen, learning to see reality, making public expenditure count in terms of impact, <coughs> local governance institutions building them up because we, even after our uh, uh, the, the panchayats and the local urban bodies have been given certain independence. They are very weak and they directly impact 80 or 90 percent of uh, human beings functioning. So with uh, these words, I would like to thank uh, my panelists because I think a whole range of issues has been brought out and I would like to thank the IGC for uh, bringing researchers and practitioners together. Thank you. Just, just one minute. Uh, I know it's been a long day. Uh, and I don't want to make a long speech of thanks, but thank you. There are uh, several categories of people I need to thank, from the planning stages, for this entire conference started about a year ago, and my colleague here, Ashok Kotwal has been a big help. Thank you, Ashok. And Maitresh has already left, but both of them provided help and guidance whenever I needed it, so thanks to them. Uh, at every stage of the game, of course, I have Dr. Shoibal Gupta walking with me and there are two parts of this conference, as you have seen. You've seen the academics, where I have played, I've not really done anything, I've listened to Ashok and Maitresh. On the other part, I have not done anything but listened to Shoibal when he got all of you together. My only contribution has been to drag Anu into this mess, I think. And I hope he forgives me for it. But thank you all of you, next, for coming to this conference and trying to make this experiment a success. So with, our, with Shoibal's help, we have got so many people, policy makers at all levels, participate in this conference. And then there were the speakers who came from far, I think amongst the speakers who came from far, I notice only two of them 
or three. No, there are some, four, five, all of them. Please, thank you very much for coming to this conference and presenting your uh, papers, your discussions, and contributing to it. And then, of course, all of you who have come have no noticed how the staff of Adri has helped us every stage of the game. Thanks to all of you. I was given a long list, and then someone came up to me and said that you should not thank anyone at all. So I, but I have to thank all of you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Till 2016.